Thank you for joining us for this exploration of the expert consensus document cardiac computed tomography for prosthetic heart valve assessment. This document is a joint effort between the Society of Cardiovascular Computed Tomography, SCCT, the American College of Cardiology, ACC, the European Society of Cardiovascular Radiology, ESCR, the North American Society of Cardiovascular Imaging, NSCI, the Radiological Society of North America, RSNA, the Society for Cardiovascular Angiography and Interventions, SCAI, and the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, STS. You can read the document in the Journal of Cardiovascular Computer Tomography. A link is available in the course description. We will be speaking with the lead author of the document, Ricardo Boudet. Dr. Boudet is a full professor of radiology at Erasmus MC and a fellow of SCCT. I am Dr. Sarah Ersesle, and I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Marta Belmonte. Our disclosures are as follows. If you are not yet a member of SCCT, we encourage you to join. This dynamic community leads the way for CCT imaging and provides an encouraging, welcoming community for anyone interested in the modality. Now, let's learn more about this exciting document. Dr. Budi, what was the reason to write this consensus document? Yeah, thank you so much for that, uh, for that question, uh, Sarah. And I think um, there were several reasons actually to, to start writing this document. I think in the last 10 years, we have seen that uh, cardiac CT is playing an increasingly large role in the assessment of prosthetic heart valves, and especially in uh, prosthetic heart valves that show signs of dysfunction. And sometimes with uh, regular imaging modalities, such as uh, echocardiography or uh, cinephoroscopy, it can be difficult to assess what the actual cause of the dysfunction is usually. Uh, these techniques, um, uh, they, they show the effects of this function, uh, but not always the exact cause of that. Um, so that has prompted uh, SCCT to uh, commission a consensus document on the use of cardiac CT to, um, to assess these prosthetic heart valves. And um, one of the things is that that the amount of literature that there is that is out there is on the one hand there are quite a lot of articles on the other hand large series are currently uh, still lacking so this document provided a unique opportunity to summarize all the information uh, that is out there uh, and also provide key recommendations based on consensus uh, by the authors on how to um, how to tackle certain aspects of uh, prosthetic heart valve assessment with cardiac CT. And I think that is also reflected in, in the societies that are endorsing this document. So we have a wide variety of medical specialists, uh, including radiologists, cardiologists, uh, but also cardiac surgeons who, of, of course, do a lot of the uh, uh, surgical implants. Uh, and also in certain countries, the, the interventional uh, transcatheter placement of valves. Um, so I think that reflects the interest of multiple societies and uh, the timeliness of this of this document. Thank you so much, Professor Badi. That seems very interesting. Could you please briefly outline the structure of this document? Yeah, so what we try to do is that we first start with an introduction, uh, what exactly uh, a heart valve replacement is, providing some technical background, for instance, on the, uh, the way prosthetic heart valves are implanted surgically and aspects that are important when assessing the uh, coronary of the, the cardiac CT scans when, when performed in these uh, patients. Then we provide a brief uh, summary of uh, other imaging modalities, such as echocardiography, cinefluoroscopy, but also nuclear medicine imaging techniques that can be used for valve assessment. Uh, providing some background and the key aspects that are, that are important in these, in these techniques. Uh, and then we start focusing on CT. First of all, we focus on how to actually uh, acquire a cardiac CT scan in a patient with a prosthetic heart valve, providing information on scan parameters, contrast injection protocols. Uh, and then um, we 
assess how uh, or we describe how to assess the valves on these uh, on these CT scans, both for surgical valves as well as transcatheter uh, valves, uh, and the normal findings that we can encounter on CT imaging. So normal opening uh, angles, for instance, of for mechanical valves, how to measure those and 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 how to assess that. And then we focus on different types of valve dysfunction and the role uh, of CT in these different types of valve dysfunction and how to interpret the images. So we focus, for instance, on obstruction, paravalvular leakage, but also on endocarditis, where we uh, think there's a large role for CT in, in diagnosing uh, prosthetic valve uh, endocarditis. And then we end the document with guidelines on how to report these scans. What are the um, important parameters that should be mentioned in the uh, report of the scan? How to do that in a structured way so you provide uh, a comprehensive assessment of the valve and also transfer all of that uh, information into a uh, concise but complete um, report of the scan that is useful um, when evaluating these uh, patients. And the, all of these uh, paragraphs are um, end with consensus statements that were devised by the entire writing group of this uh, of this document, summarizing the key points and providing um, yeah, guidance for people that want to do prosthetic heart valve assessment with cardiac CT. Thanks a lot for your reply. So if possible, let's focus briefly on the CT scan protocol for PHV assessment. Uh, which are the recommendations for a CT scan protocol provided by this document? Yeah, so I think that's, uh, that's an excellent question. And that's one of the things that we discussed also within the writing group, because um, there are various ways, of course, that you that you can uh, acquire these scans, and especially with the modern scanners, the, the the, the types of acquisition protocols that you can devise um, or co can construct to increase. What we think is, is most important that all of the acquisitions at least include an arterial phase acquisition, especially if you're looking at um, a left-sided uh, valve, so in the mitral or the aortic uh, position. Um, and that should ideally be either a retrospectively EKG-gated scan or a prospective wide window EKG triggered scan, because what we want to do, we want to capture all of the phases of the cardiac cycle to enable to do cine reconstructions of the valve. So we can assess the valve leaflet motion, uh, we can measure uh, opening and closing angles of the valve, and also if we see certain abnormalities in a specific phase of the cardiac cycle that we can um, confirm the presence also in other phases because some of the valves may show some uh, artifacts that you see, especially in the phases where you have a lot of motion of the valve. And if you can confirm a finding in different phases, that makes it much more likely that that is indeed a true abnormality and not just an, uh, an artifact. Um, now having uh, this uh, full cycle um, acquisition in the arterial phase for left-sided valves. And of course, if you're looking at right-sided valves in the tricuspid or the pulmonary position, you should adapt your contrast injection, injection protocol so that the right side of the heart has a good opacification as well. Um, there are two other phases that you can consider adding to this um, acquisition. First of all, you can do a non-contrast enhanced acquisition prior to the arterial phase, which can be helpful to uh, look for calcifications that might be less easily seen in the arterial phase, especially if you have very dense contrast. And you can um, use that phase to look at surgical material. So for instance, if you have a surgically implanted valves, valve, you, uh, some surgeons use uh, sutures that have uh, platchets attached to them. These are very small Teflon patches on the, uh, on the sutures that are hyperdense on CT. And they might be mistaken for a paravalvular leak on the arterial phase, for instance. But if you have a non-contrast enhanced uh, acquisition as well, you can use that to um, to see that there, these are indeed this is indeed surgical material. So that might help. Now you could also, if you do spectral imaging with a uh, 
with a scanner that offers dual energy uh, applications, or you use a photon counting scanner, you could also think about skipping the non-contrast enhanced scan and reconstructing that from the arterial phase as a virtual non-contrast, for instance. Now, the third uh, phase that you can um, think about is a, a delayed phase uh, scan. And uh, that can be uh, helpful, for instance, in patients that uh, where you suspect that you suspect of having endocarditis. So it can be helpful to uh, to better delineate abscess formation, but also if you include, for instance, um, um, the uh, a larger field of view of the chest and the upper part of the abdomen, you might see, for instance. Um, 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 abscesses in the in the spleen, which are not uncommon in endocarditis. So that's another phase you could could add uh, to that. Those both the non-contrast enhance and the delayed phase do not have to be retrospectively gated. Just a single phase is enough. Um, so those are the basically the three components. So always a retrospect or, or, or a full cycle acquisition and then optionally add a non-contrast analysis acquisition and a delayed phase acquisition. Being a multimodality imager, I would be really interested. How do you see the role of CT with respect to other imaging modalities for a PHV assessment? Yeah, I think that's, that's another great question and also a very important one. And I think it's important to stress that CT is not going to replace echocardiography, for instance, that will, that is and will remain the first line imaging modality to, to assess uh, prosthetic heart valves. Uh, and it, of course, it's a great modality because it's non-invasive. It provides both anatomical and functional information and it's always a very good starting point. Um, so I think that if you look at CT, it's a complementary technique to echocardiography um, that combines the best of both worlds where you have the superior anatomical information by CT, where you can look at the valve in much more detail than you can with echocardiography. But of course, CT does not provide you with the functional information, such as pressure gradients or, uh, and of course, the Doppler, um, the color Doppler imaging with, with, with paravalvular leakage, for instance. Um, and, and then, of course, there's nuclear imaging, especially PET-CT, which is very helpful in case of uh, suspected endocarditis. Um, where I think uh, adding a, car a, a cardiac CTA to a, a PET scan also helps to better um, to better assess the peri, especially in the aortic root, the, the area there. If you see an increased FDG uptake, for instance, what structure actually is there? Is that a myocardic aneurysm? Is it something else? So I think, especially in these patients with prosthetic valves that can be yeah, quite complicated patients with the difficult pathology, combining all the imaging modalities um, provides you with a comp comprehensive assessment of the, uh, of the patient and um, using the strengths of each modality to, um, yeah, to, to optimally assess these, uh, these valves. And uh, can you highlight what information is provided by CT in case of PHV dysfunction that cannot be obtained by other modalities? Well, it depends a bit on the type of dysfunction, but for instance, if you have a case of uh, valve obstruction, um, usually with echocardiography, of course, you detect a, an increased pressure gradient over the valve. The strength of CT is in um, delineating the anatomy around the valve and also, for instance, showing hypodense areas on the valve which could uh, uh, be due to thrombus formation. And we know that there are specific patterns where around the valve when we see that, that could be more uh, aligned with thrombus. But we could also, for instance, see a crescent-shaped hypodense rim underneath the valve, which is indicative of pulmonary formation. Now, of course, two different entities, both causing obstruction, but requiring a, a different treatment where you could go for thrombolysis with the valve uh, thrombosis, versus surgery for pulmonary uh, formation. Um, I think if you look at endocarditis, um, the, the strength of CT is especially the delineation uh, of mycotic aneurysms in the aortic root, where we can nicely visualize the extent of the mycotic aneurysms, their location, uh, also the relation to the surrounding structures, such as, for instance, the, uh, the coronary arteries. 
Um, and also in these complex patients where you think about reoperating them, uh, CT also provides a wealth of information for the surgeon. For instance, the, um, the distance between the posterior side of the sternum and the anterior side of the heart, which is useful in, in reoperation. So uh, the surgeon is prepared um, if there is a very close relationship that they do not inadvertently uh, damage the heart when performing the re-sternotomy. Uh, but also information about the calcifications in the uh, ascending aorta, uh, which is used for cannulation for the uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, um, where, uh, um, where you can find the best way where to place the aortic uh, cannula without uh, having to go through large amounts of calcification, for instance, with the risk of stroke. So. I think these are some of the examples of where CT provides the uh, complementary information to the other imaging modalities. So thank you for this very interesting insight on this document. Um, thank you, Dr. Belmonte as well. Um, and thanks everyone watching this right now. And I recommend you to use the link um, to the guidelines, which is available in the course description. And I hope um, this guidelines will help you to improve and demeriate um, uh, your efforts in assessing PHV. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.